Hi, my name is Sheila Guillotown, and this is The Simsbury Woman. Today we're going to talk about scams and how to protect yourself from being defrauded. The Federal Trade Commission estimates that over 10 million Americans have their identities stolen and misused in some way every year. The cost to consumers and businesses can only be estimated, but it's thought to be in excess of $5 billion for individuals and $50 billion for businesses, and these numbers are annual numbers. Scams have been around as long as commerce, and monetary transactions have existed, but with the introduction of the internet, new and more sophisticated scams are concocted every day. From envelope stuffing schemes promising to make lots of money from home, to all the various Nigerian scams, if it seems too good to be true, listen to your instincts it's likely to be a scam. You can be sure that no Nigerian prince or business is going to send you thousands of dollars just for helping them get money into the country for a small investment on your part, of course. The scams are everywhere. Most will try and look legitimate, but things like phishing, spoofing, spam, and threatening phone calls are only a few of the ways that scammers will try to get enough of your personal information uh, to inflict damage. My guest today is PFC Lauren Devon of the Simsbury Police Department, a nine-year veteran of our police force. She's currently assigned to the Community Services Division as a Community Service Officer. Her expertise will give our viewers some very sound advice on how to protect themselves and their families and their credit. Welcome, Officer Devon. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. Uh, you're quite familiar with the scams and the basic problems. Let's start with, I guess, the biggest, which is generally identity theft and the various ways that scammers get your identity. Identity theft at its basis is one of the most common ways that people are victimized and become victims of scams and frauds. Uh, identity theft is basically when some unknown person gains access to any portion of your personal identifying information. And what we, what we define as personal identifying information would be things like your full name, your date of birth, um, your social security number, any of your bank account numbers or anything like that. Um, once somebody has access to any of that information, it's very easy for them to then um, make credit cards in your name, to take out bank accounts in your name, take out loans, um, and scam you in a variety of different ways. Okay, we hear a lot of terms that perhaps you could define uh, for our viewers. Um, things like phishing, which is spelled funny, <laughs> um, and spoofing. So why don't you tell us what the difference is between those two? Phishing and spoofing are both very similar and they uh, both occur through electronic means, so either through email or text message. One of the most common ones that we've had have come from some of the banks that we have here in town. Um, Simsbury Bank was uh, being utilized to um, for a scam where they were sending out emails and text messages just kind of as a blanket whether you were a Simsbury Bank customer or not you were getting these um, emails or text messages and they appeared very official um, their logo was official it was coming from a Simsbury Bank email address and that is what phishing is when something appears to be normal it appears to be official and legitimate and so they kind of are able to reel you in into believing that it is the legitimate organization that's contacting you and now they want you to either click on some links that are going to put malware into your computer or they want you to um, verify your account information so in an attempt to get you to give up some of your personal identifying information. Okay. I know some of them can be scary. I've gotten a few of them myself and mostly they'll say things like, if you don't get back to us in, you know, 10 minutes, your account is going to be frozen. Right. And that should be a red flag to some people. No legitimate organization is going to, to operate that way. 
Um, and so we encourage you when things like that happen to try to stay calm to it's it is very easy to get <laughs> alarmed but you know to try and stay calm to try and think rationally and not react immediately um, instead to contact that legitimate organization so contact Simsbury Bank directly through a number on the back of your card or through a number on your account statement so that you know that you're speaking to an actual representative and get the information and you're going to be assured most of the time that you know, no, this is we not, there's, this. yeah, there's not anything wrong with your account. So, okay. All right. And that was phishing. Yes. Now spoofing. Spoofing is very, very similar okay. to that. So spoofing is again, they're utilizing logos. They're utilizing, um, email addresses and things that are trying to make you think that this is coming from an actual agency. Um, Easy Pass was another one that we had a few years ago. Yeah, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about, I've had an Easy Pass since we lived yeah. in New York. Yeah. And I saw it on the list and just so our viewers know, the Simsbury Police Department has an extremely good website. We will give you the link at the end. Um, and it lists many of the, the most common scams. And if you click on them, it will explain it. But I saw Easy Pass and I went, okay, how do you, what does that get anybody? Yeah, it just gets them access to your Easy Pass account. So it was an email that had a, a very official looking Easy Pass logo and it said that there was a problem with your account and it wanted it uh, provided a link. It wanted you to log into your Easy Pass account using that link and obviously any um, personal identifying information, any credit card information that you might have stored in that account then would have been vulnerable to being accessed by okay, an so unknown person. I have my account set up so that it automatically replenishes if i had clicked on that link they could have gotten that credit absolutely, card absolutely yeah access oh. to that credit card <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> so. okay um all right um let's talk a little bit about the thing that's in the, the news most especially now as we're coming into march and april the various irs scams which uh, account for a huge portion of uh, the money that's lost. Um, let's start with the telephone. Um, I've gotten calls. Um, how and why do these work? And I mean, I know the answer, but <laughs> why don't you tell us? Um, these criminals, people who are doing these scams are opportunistic. So they look at March and April as being tax time. People are preparing their tax documents. They have taxes on their mind. And so now when they get a phone call from the IRS, they're not thinking it's really um, that far out of the realm of possibility that they might be being contacted by the IRS. Um, one of the things that we try to put out to people and try to assure them is that that is not how the IRS operates. They don't contact you by phone. Um, they will not ask for personal identifying information over the phone or through any other means. Um, other than snail mail. Other than mail. They operate uh, solely through the mail. Okay. Um, and so we try to assure people that that is not how they, they operate. Um, also, when these people with the IRS, when they're demanding certain things, they're demanding uh, money in the form of gift cards, which should be a red flag to you that the IRS would not be interested in gift cards or iTunes gift cards or anything like that. Okay. So, um, and again, they work just because they're opportunistic. Like a lot of these scams, they come around at a certain time of year when people are already thinking about it. Um, and so when they get the phone call, they're not thinking it's it's not possible for the IRS to be contacting them. And these guys are very aggressive. They are very aggressive. They are very aggressive and they can be very alarming. And that's why, um, you know, we try to remind people that, again, that's not how an actual person from the IRS is going to, to treat somebody um, in the community when they're trying to make contact with them. I mean, they actually tell people they're going to issue a bench warrant for their arrests. Yes, And absolutely. people believe that? Some people do, and that's why, unfortunately, we have a lot of elderly members of the community who are being victimized in this because somebody from um, a younger generation kind of thinks about it a little differently and is a little more skeptical of people. People who are elderly are naturally good-hearted, and they want to believe um, in the kindness of people and... Um, they can easily be victimized by this because they think that maybe something happened and um, they might have done something wrong 
so they they react solely on you know with their hearts and go and provide them the information that they want they get the itunes gift cards and don't think anything about it now when you get a, a gift card what do you i i don't even know how that works i mean do you give them the number that's on the right back of the yeah card? Is the that... numbers on the card because that's really all you need to be you don't necessarily need a physical card okay so they don't the have to send it somewhere they just have to provide right, this the numbers with and the numbers, like that, yeah. which is then allows them to access the money. Right, exactly. Because they, if if it was an iTunes gift card, the individual would go and per, have to purchase it, so it would be in the amount of a certain, you know, a hundred dollars or right. fifty dollars or whatever, um, and then they, the the money is on that card that with the numbers they can just access it. Now, can the the police or FBI or the Secret Service or whoever it is that's responsible can they? track those people or is that money just gone the money is is most likely gone oh. um it's uh, it's occurring outside of the country even if it doesn't appear oh, to be a, occurring okay. outside of the country a lot of this is is occurring okay in other countries so unfortunately with things like these types of scams um once that money is out there it's it's gone okay. if your identity is stolen and your bank account is accessed or somebody makes fraudulent charges on a credit card you do have a little bit more recourse um, we can investigate it depending on where the transactions had occurred if they've occurred locally or even if they haven't occurred locally um, we can use you know an interagency approach to try and investigate that more thoroughly and see if we can come up with suspects um, and the bank will most likely refund you your mm -hmm. money for those types of things but these types of scams the grandparent scams, um, the Nigerian scams, things like that. Once you wire any kind of money or you're providing the numbers for those electronic gift cards, that the money is gone. Okay, we had spoken before, and since we were just talking about um, the vulnerability of senior citizens, Explain the grandfather scam. The grandparent scam. The grandparent yeah. scam. Sorry. The grandparent scam is extremely common. Um, when I first started here nine years ago, we were seeing it a lot more, and we were seeing a lot of elderly individuals in the community being victimized in large sums of money. Um, we have done a lot and reached out a lot to our elderly communities, um, now, how's it people work? in the community. I'm I'm not a grandparent, but. If I were a grandparent, how does the scam work? It's really pretty basic. Somebody will call you and say, hi, grandma. And the elderly individual most naturally responds with, oh, hi, is this you? And they'll say the name of one of their grandchildren. Okay. Um, and then the scammer on the other end of the line just kind of takes over at that point. Yes, it's your grandchild whatever their name whatever. is. And now they start having a conversation. And the conversation usually goes to that they are outside of the country they were on spring break um and they it could have been that they were on spring break and now they're arrested to something oh, as far okay. as um they were into a car accident or they got pulled over by the police and something awful happened and they need money, money. they need the money immediately they need it to be wired um please don't tell my mom or dad so they're really trying to get them to keep it to themselves as far as what had happened um, and again, the elderly person is just reacting and... Well, you're going to do anything for your grandchild. It, absolutely. And so they go and get the money, wire the money. And again, that's once the money's wired... It's gone. It's gone. Yep. Okay. Um, do they... I mean, what's roughly the average? Do you have any idea of what roughly the average amount that these... It really just depends, depends. because once they take the bait yeah. and they go and transfer money, it might be something small to start with, you know, anywhere between 500 and $1,000. But once... <laughs> okay, that's not my idea of small, but okay. <laughs> once they do it once, they might be getting contacted again, kind of on a daily basis that they need more and more. Um, and... You know, I personally have seen elderly individuals victimized in the amount, you know, upwards of thirteen to fifteen thousand oh, dollars wow. total. So, wow. Yes. I. Uh, this is going to sound incredibly naive, but where do you get a money order? <laughs> Uh, Walmart. Oh, I mean, okay. you can, what they're asking for is not necessarily like a money order that you would get from your bank. Yeah, because that would be my normal instinct. Right. Would be they're to go asking to the bank for a, and get a bank check, a or... money gram, which is okay. something that you can get at Walmart or CVS. Okay. 
um, and you fill it out, the person who's trying to scam you will tell you exactly where it needs to go to because you need all that information to fill out the MoneyGram, um, and then it's sent, and it's essentially like handing somebody cash. Once, really? As soon as it's received, it's it's instant. And the, it goes to some, I don't know, a... a another walmart location or i mean yeah I, oh okay another walmart location or, or whatever. pharmacy location oh, yeah okay um but what's good is that the individuals at the bank so if some if an elderly person or any person is coming in and speaking to their bank representative and saying that they want to take out a large sum of money the banks are have knowledge of this and are trying to talk to people so they've they've contacted us before when they've had somebody in who was trying to take out money um I was contacted one time by staff at the library for oh, okay. um, an individual who was actually trying to, he had stopped at the library because he was lost. He was trying to get somewhere so that he could um, get out money. And what he was telling the library staff was apparent that he was being okay. um, the victim of one of these grandparent scams. So it was, it was great that they knew enough to contact us, but even the people at Walmart are trained to know okay. that if they see somebody who's trying to do this to try and, con and you know, contact who please does or, this regularly. Right. Okay. So. One thing we talked about, which I honestly didn't know about, and you scared me to death, <laughs> um, was skimming. Yes. And explain skimming. You showed me a few pictures that were like, frightening. Yeah, skimming is when you physically hand your credit card to someone and they are able to take the information off of it. And um, it doesn't really even have to happen in a hand-to-hand -hand transaction, but it can occur with devices that are put onto gas pumps, devices that are attached to ATMs, um, the little square trade things that you can buy off the internet that you plug right into your cell phone. Oh yeah. You can skim so them. So a lot of Anybody. small business people use those exactly. now so they can yep. take credit cards. Yep. And those can be used as skimmers? Absolutely. If wow. you, you know, think about it really just depends on how vigilant you want to be with your personal identifying information, your credit cards and things. But if you go to a restaurant, a waiter or waitress could, and you give them your, your card. credit card to pay the bill, right. they could very easily have a skimming device um, on a cell phone, a square trade, and be able to swipe it, the information. Um, you frightened me most, though, with the gas station. Yeah. Now, I use... Uh, you know, a card that gives me, if I use my card and it goes directly to my checking account, I get an extra 10 cents a gallon off. Mm -hmm. But you said I should be looking for something before I put that card in the pump. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of times if you're looking at the the gas pump, you may be able to see the part where you insert the credit card might look a little different than it normally has. Um, so you can give it a wiggle or see ah. if it if it moves around a lot. So but if it looks like it's been attached. Yeah, if something looks like it's been attached to it. Okay, and you said the same thing with the same thing with, with ATMs. An ATM machine. Yeah, just kind of poke around, look around, and see if you see any hidden cameras um, or anything that's been attached to the ATM before okay. you're putting your card. Tell in. us the story of. The Buckland Mall ATM. That was kind of fascinating. <laughs> yeah, that was that's actually happened um, in the 90s, so it's kind of an old story. But um, a group of scammers put a machine in the middle of the Buckland Hills Mall, and they labeled it as an ATM. And uh, people were going up to it and putting their credit card in. Um, they were prompted to enter their PIN, so they did. And instead of getting money, they got an error. Um, message on the screen saying that the machine wasn't functioning so okay. spit their card back out um, it was just a big skimming device essentially wow um, when these people put their credit card in and put their pin in mm -hmm. it recorded the information so um, they got their card back they so got their card they didn't back even realize probably didn't think twice about it happened. yeah but it ended up just being they were then vulnerable to identity theft because their information had been compromised. They got all of it. They got everything, including right. your pin. Right. Wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> let's talk a little bit um, about um, paying over the internet because there's another thing that you were talking about the other day, uh, which I had never heard of. Well, I mean, I guess I'd heard of it on CSI and programs <laughs> like that, but check washing. Yes. Which in a place like Simsbury, uh, where you can frequently put your mail out and put the flag up, 
Um, explain check washing and why you shouldn't use it for <laughs> paying bills. <laughs> so check washing um, can actually be done really easily. Um, we call that little red flag on the mailbox the um, theft alert flag. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, it, it's not out of it's not that uncommon to have um, individuals who walk through neighborhoods and look for that and know that people probably are paying bills um, and can actually go up and steal your mail. They'll remove it right from your mailbox, open it up. If there's a check inside with some common household chemicals, um, you can soak the check and it absorbs the ink. And if you let it dry, then they can rewrite it to anyone that they want in any amount that they want. Okay. So, But you said there's also you have to be careful because there are certain pens you should or shouldn't use. Yeah, certain, um, I think they say the rollerball, more the gel-based inks are harder to erase. Mm. So you can utilize those for uh, writing okay. checks. Okay. Or so, you can pay your bills online or you can just put, you know, bring your mail directly to the post to office. To the post office yeah. and that's not going to happen. I know I have this argument with my mother-in-law all the time about whether or not it's safe to pay your bills online. But, right. Um, as long as you, if you do, I don't know anyone actually who still, except her, who still writes checks. <laughs> um, but as long as you maintain reasonable security, um, yeah, paying online is is fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. What else um, do we have? Um, the potential. You have the Ebola scams now. How in heaven's name do you, and I know Ebola is old, so it's probably now, um, you know, the mosquito virus or, you know, whatever new threat has come in. Again, it's just, it's, oppor it's opportunity. It's opportunistic. The Ebola scam came around at a time that Ebola was in the news. It was everywhere. Um, and what it, th what the scam ended up being was people who were contacting um, you to donate money for uh, Ebola. Okay. For, you know, care, for clinics, for things like that. And the money was not actually being used for that type of a thing. So. Which I guess leads us directly into charity scams. Right. And they operate basically the same way. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So how do you know when, uh, when you get a phone call or you get an email, um, what do you have to do to make sure that what you're contributing to is legitimate and somebody hasn't just I mean there's just so many we just ask you not to react immediately you know if you are you know somebody reaches out to you for a certain fund that you feel passionate enough about that you want to make a donation we ask you just to do your research just to you know take the time to look at it to look it up to talk to other people and just to make sure that it is a legitimate agency that you're donating to and that the funds are going to be used the way that you're hoping that they will okay all right um it's not really a scam but i think you know people should also be aware when they get phone calls that um you should find out if in fact this is the charity or if this is um, someone who's being paid. Right. And I always ask, you know, right. are you a paid solicitor? And I'm stunned when they say how much money they're getting as opposed to what's going to right. the charity. Right. Um, so we kind of have to, to worry about that. Right. Um, okay. Um, something happened on the news the other night which i found rather alarming actually two things that i found rather alarming apparently years ago the irs we're going back to the irs because that is one of the big ones um used to use bill collectors and they just announced on the news the other night that they're going back to using bill collectors um now what do you know about that the supposedly they have put protections in place so that but doesn't this just feed into the the irs scams it'll be interesting to see what happens um this upcoming tax season with regard to this i think it will provide a little bit of it's going to make things a little bit more confusing um because one of the things that we we had 
gone back to was that the IRS wasn't going to contact you over the phone. They were only going to contact you by mail. So um, we're really going to have to remind people to be conscientious of who is contacting them. And if the IRS is saying that they're putting safeguards in place, to know what those safeguards are mm. so that you know what to ask or what to look for when you're being contacted by them so that you can be sure that it is the legitimate IRS and not somebody who is pretending to be somebody from the IRS. Okay, I think one of the things that they said is that they're not going to use a bill collector if the person hasn't already been contacted by mail and knows that there okay. is in fact an IRS case right. in progress. Right. It's not just going to come out of the blue like the, the scammers do. Right. Okay, the other thing which um, again technology breeds more and more interesting, I guess that's not the <laughs> proper word, but more and more interesting ways uh, to get to people. Right. And uh, apparently there are now uh, ways that they can record your voice and then manipulate the recording so that you can be saying, hi, this is Sheila, um, you know, to my banker and I want, you know, X amount of money transferred to, now I have to have the numbers obviously, but apparently um, with an app you can buy from the app store, you can actually buy one of these applications and create your own, uh, so I assume we go back to the basics. The basics. Yeah. Don't give out your personal right. information. Right. If they're not, if they can't record you saying your personal information, um, then they don't have the ability to defraud you. So it really all goes back to knowing who you're talking to over the phone and not giving out that information. Okay. I don't consider myself to be particularly a novice, but I myself, we talked about this, <laughs> got hit the other day. It seemed like it was coming from the Bank of America. I, and it was curious because what it said was, if you don't want to get another one of these product uh, information, click here. Right. Dumbly, I <laughs> clicked. And the minute I clicked, I got a screen that asked me for my name, my right. social security number, my address. Now I immediately closed that window. Is that sufficient or do I, I actually did go in and change all my passwords because yeah. I'm a little paranoid. Yeah. But that I thought was particularly sneaky. Yeah, absolutely. But that's the way that they're gonna, okay. they gotta so get you to click here and- Don't click. Right. Right, so if they're offering you something and it's something you think you might be interested in, call the bank. Absolutely, call the bank, contact the bank directly. Okay. All but right. I mean, if you, you know, you knew enough that when you were prompted to give up your personal information right. to get out of get that. Get out of it, okay. And it wasn't fast enough to, for them to get into my computer and put anything in there. Right. Okay. Well, we've only scratched the surface of the various ways that scammers work. Um, it's not possible to completely protect yourself, but the best advice is to be alert. Never give out your personal information to anyone, no matter how legitimate they seem to be. Be suspicious, which is difficult for some people. If you get a call or an email from what seems to be even your own bank, don't respond to the caller or to the email. Call the bank directly. We'll say it again. The IRS will never ask you to pay your taxes with gift cards or money orders. Don't ever click on attachments to emails unless you know who sent you the email. And even then, you have to be wary because someone may have spoofed your friend's email. The resources of the Simsbury Police Department are excellent. They do an amazing job. Um, Officer Devon has a presentation that she's more than willing to give out to uh, various groups, please don't be embarrassed to call them. All of us, even the most computer literate, have slipped once or twice and clicked on an item or replied to an email that we know we shouldn't have. Remember, new scams are being created every day and you don't want to be a victim. Um, we've put up the resources from the police department at the end of this program. Um, and I hope you'll take advantage of um, the information that they have. I wish all our viewers a healthy and a safe day. Thank you, Officer Devin. Thank you.